Now, we're going to spend some time meditating on the Passion narrative of uh, John, which goes from 18.1 to the last verse of chapter 19. Um, I'm not going to be able, obviously, but I just want to touch on some points that might help get us all ready for Holy Week and might help reflecting on the Gospel. We just finished chapter 17, which is all about the prayer of Jesus. For them do I sanctify myself. And now it starts. Having said these things, Jesus went out with his disciples across the brook Kedron, where there was a garden, into which he entered, he and his disciples. Judas, the one to hand him over, knew the place as well, because Jesus often came together there with his disciples. So Judas and officers from the high priest and the Pharisees came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. This is the man who stood there in the temple, totally defenseless, not with an armed crowd around him. And now they're after him. they got to come out with lanterns and torches and weapons. What are they afraid of? Then Jesus, knowing all that was coming upon him, went out and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him and said, Jesus, the Nazarene. And he said to them, I am. Meaning, I am he. But the text said, Ego imi, I am. Just the same as chapter 6. Don't be afraid, Ego imi. When he's walking on the water toward the boat. That is saying, Anihu. That's God. He's saying, I am. You see? I am he, but I am. Judas, the one to hand him over, was standing with them. When he said to them, I am, they all, including Judas, fell back to the ground. So he asked them again, whom do you seek? So now we know, who is this one going to his death? I am. He is Adonai himself. I am. Okay. Um, I want to look, uh, you see, so then the cohort and the tribune and the officers arrested Jesus and bound him. All of a sudden he has to be bound. Do you see how evil is always scared? He might get away. He might do something. We've got to bind him up. The one who just stood there. You see? So they led him to Ar- 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 Annas first. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas. And... Um, It was Caiaphas who counseled the Jews. It was advantageous for one man to die for the people. And then starts the tragedy. Simon Peter was following Jesus. Ironic, right? He's supposed to follow Jesus. He's a disciple. But not a hundred yards back. That other disciple was known to the high priest. And so then, Jesus, Peter rather, was standing near the door outside. Um. And spoke to the, the one, the other disciple, the one known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and laid people in, let Peter in. Then the girl gatekeeper said to Peter, You are not one of those disciples of his, are you? I am not. Jesus had just said, I am. He says, I am not. The servants were warming themselves. Then it comes to this. The high priest questions Jesus. Now we got him, about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered them, listen to his majesty. I have spoken openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues and the temple where all the Jews meet together. And in secret, I spoke nothing. Why do you question me? Question those who have heard what I spoke to them. After all, they know what I said. As he said this, one of the officers standing there gave a slap to Jesus, saying, Is that the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I spoke wrongly, witness to the wrong. If well, then why do you hit me? So sometimes you don't turn the cheek. You challenge. Why are you hitting me? What have I said wrong? You see? And then we have this... um, um, Simon was standing, warming himself. And they said, you're not one of his disciples, are you? He said, oh, no. And then another one said, um, 
Didn't I see you in the garden with him? And again, Peter denied it. And then, uh, uh, oops, uh, I'm going to have to use my, this is the Jerusalem Bible, it's quite good. I always like my own translation because I can save time explaining the words if I do that. However, we're going to have to do this now. Okay. Jesus is uh, now going to be before Pilate. When you ponder this, notice one thing. It's true of everybody who's a captive to the world. They oscillate. They led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the Praetorium. That's the Pilate's place. It was now morning. They didn't go into the Praetorium because they didn't want to get uh, impure. Gentile's place, we won't be able to eat the Passover. You're going to kill a man. In fact, you're going to kill the Son of God. That doesn't seem to cross your mind. Um, so Pilate goes out to them. And they, what's the charge? If you weren't a criminal, he wouldn't be standing handing him over to you. Peter said, take him yourself. Uh, we are not allowed to put a man to death. It was true at that time. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and called Jesus. Now you watch the worldly man. He goes out to them. He goes in. He goes out. He goes in. John, in his style, is saying, watch it. If you are attached to the world, you'll go out and in, you'll go out and in, but you will not stand with Jesus. You need the Holy Spirit, and you must start to pray for that, you see? And so, um, and then, uh, Jesus heard them say this about, you're no friend of Caesar's, huh? and that um, um, because he claimed to be the Son of God. Now, Pilate had no idea who God was, but he was very frightened by that. Uh, he's got some connection with these super-terrestrial powers, whatever they are, you see? And so, he, he collapses. Huh? We have no king except Caesar. In that line, the Jewish people, not knowing it perhaps, but, you know, reject Ever since 1 Samuel, they wanted a king appointed by God and God to be their king. Now they're saying, our only king is the secular government. Do you see the temptation today for Christians? Whatever the government says, we will do. You can't if it's immoral. You can't go along with abortion. It's immoral. We have no king but Caesar. Yes, we do. We have Jesus. Okay, so then, uh, we move on. Uh, so they, he goes to Golgotha, and um, there they crucified him, with him two others, one here, one there, and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had also written a notice and put it on the cross. It was written, Jesus the Nazarene, the king of the Jews. He did that in your face. You see? Well, because he had faith. Many of the Jews read this because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. They always crucified people near the city. Why? Everyone going in and out of the gate to the city would see this poor guy hanging there, nailed. Don't cross Rome. And so, um, it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. Chief priests, as you know the story, he said, uh, what I have written, I have written. And then, uh, one of these mysterious incidents, the soldiers took his garments, probably part of their pay. It's an ugly job to nail a guy to a cross, even if you're a professional. So part of the pay would be you could keep his clothes, which is exactly, of course, what Psalm 22 had already predicted. Huh? Let's not tear it. Instead, let's toss for it to, to see whose it will be that the scripture might be fulfilled, and then he quotes Psalm 22. It's also then 
You see, don't tear the garment of Christ, which is the church. Don't pull the church apart, okay? Um, Athanasius wrote once, At that time also the altogether wicked heretics and ignorant schismatics are in the same case as the Jews who killed the Lord. The one, the Arians, and that they slay the word, the other, the Miletians, and that they rend the garment. The, uh, 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 the church, the body. All right. I want to spend some time now. We have a few minutes more. Uh, on uh, verses 25 to 30. There were standing by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and the sister of his mother, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Then Jesus, seeing the mother and the disciples standing there whom he loved, said to the mother, Woman, this is the first time he has addressed her since Cana. In both places he calls her Eve. Woman, you see, behold your mother. I'm sorry. Woman, behold your son. Now, I've already pointed out, you may have forgotten, that there's this rhythm in many Johannine texts as he Seeing and saying. Seeing and then revealing. Seeing um, Nathaniel, he said, Behold an Israelite. Seeing Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God. Okay. Behold woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple received her into his own. Now this text, of course, has been variously interpreted over the years. Is it is he just saying, take care of my mother? Because after all, if she's a virgin and has no other children, you know, take care of my mother. He's saying much more than that. Huh? Behold your mother. Seeing, saying. And therefore we have this text, okay? Behold your mother. And John, John is the church. And he's standing there. And then, he says to him, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple received her into his own. But what are his own? Those things that belong to him as a believer. He receives her among those gifts that the, the Lord gives us from his cross, namely, mother. So she is the church in one way, you know, being mother to John, but she is also herself being mother to John. Later on in the patristics, as this truth got more and more embedded in people, huh? there's a book by Hugh Ronner. I forgot the name of it now. But he points to many texts where they just say, you know, Mary, that is the church, or the church, that is Mary, because that's what you call that um, gathering huh? of a corporate personality. Some person embodies all the features of the collectivity. Like Jesus is Israel. We just had it, uh, or we could have seen it, in the servant song. You are Israel. The servant sums up the whole vocation of Israel to be a light to the nations. How? By dying in an act of love, by which all our sin is, is taken away, and then by rising in a burst of glory, and therefore giving us eternal life. Huh? And so, from that, behold your mother, and from that hour, the disciple received her into his own, into those things that belong to him as believer. After this, after this giving of the woman to the son, and the son to the woman, the mother, after this, Jesus knowing that now, all things had been accomplished, the last thing to be accomplished, is that giving of John to Mary and Mary to John. That is, the church to Mary and Mary to the church. In order the scripture be fulfilled, said, I thirst. But the last thing, knowing now, after that, the very next line, all things have been accomplished. It took centuries to work all this out, but it's quite clear. And so then, they offer him wine, and bowing his head, he handed over the spirit. 
Somebody went through, as you can now, because it's all on, on CDs, you can do a search. Huh? Did anywhere anybody ever say about dying, handed over the Spirit? No. It means handed over the Spirit. It means dying. But it means more than that. And John does this throughout his Gospel. It means We used to translate that, gave up the ghost. Way back in the old Douay, I think. He handed over the Spirit means, from now on, my Spirit will run the church. My spirit will animate the church. My spirit will enliven and give strength and courage to the church. My spirit will hover over water, wine, bread, oil, and he will be the one who takes care of the church. And that's what it means in the first letter of John, in 1 John 5, 6. He's the one who came, and he's the one who bears witness. The witness is to make the real reality of coming alive to you and to me. That's the role of the Spirit. He will teach you all things when He comes. He's come, my friends. And the fruit of the Lord's passion is the presence of the Holy Spirit.